All right, so as I mentioned this morning, we're continuing the, um, my little series on the so-called Christian cults, and tonight we're going over the cult of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and of course we're starting out here in Daniel chapter 8, which, you know, if, if you want to form false doctrines and, and start a cult, you usually you go to some of the more difficult passages to understand. And as you read through the passage, obviously there's a lot of things going on here and symbolism and the goat coming up and, the, and the, you know, their horn being broken and all this stuff, you know, real symbolic language, which is still described in this chapter and given the explanation of the Medes and the Persians and the four kingdoms that come up and stuff. But the reason why we're starting off here is because, and I'll give you just a little bit of a history of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I'm going to say this right off the, right off the bat is that, and, and I'm going to kind of wrap up with this as well, is that modern-day Seventh-day Adventists probably don't know a lot of what I'm going to teach tonight. It's, it's not something that's like commonly taught within their religion. But there are things, so like, I'm going to give you the history, I'm going to give you uh, information about Ellen G. White and who she was and why that's, she's important in that movement. And, you know, just so you have the information because it's, it's really astonishing. It's always astonishing to me how these cults form and actually get people to follow them when you read everything that they say, but it just obviously shows that, you know, I mean, it's the blind leading the blind. And when people are lost, they, you know, they don't have the light, they don't have the truth, they'll follow just about anything. So, um, we see that happening. And again, as I mentioned this morning, and I'm going to say this every time I preach on these subjects, you know, our, our goal here is not to just lift ourselves up and say, look how stupid these people are. Look how smart we are, you know, and, and just to put down everyone else and say, ah, we have the truth. We're the only ones that are smart. We, you know, you guys are all stupid. That's not the point at all. The, the point is to demonstrate and illustrate what other people are out there believing, ultimately to help us win people to Christ. And I've mentioned this before, but the very first method, the method that we always use in giving people the gospel is to give them the gospel. No matter who they are, no matter what their background is, we give them the gospel. And if someone is willing to listen to you give them the gospel, preach to them Jesus, preach the death, burial, resurrection, preach to them eternal life, preach you know, all the things that we do to anybody, regardless of their background, if they're willing to listen to you that far, but they have one of these backgrounds or Jehovah's Witness or they're a Mormon or they're a Seventh-day Adventist or whatever, you know, if they're open enough to have this discussion, well, and they still haven't quite gotten it or, or embraced the gospel, but they're still willing to talk, hey, now you have a little bit more that you should be able to go into to maybe help dismantle what they might have been taught. A lot of Seventh-day Adventists were in it. You know, a lot of these cults, actually, the people have been brought up in these cults, and that's why they're in it today. Of course, you're going to have some converts, but with, with the cults that we've been going over recently, there's not nearly as many converts here in the United States. I mean, they, they're getting converts in, in other parts of the world, but here in the United States, because of all the, the prophecies that have failed, it's a lot harder to convince people to convert to their religion. So a lot of them are just still have been born into it and have been in it for a long time. I'm not saying they don't get any new converts, but it's, it's not like it used to be in their heyday back in the, the 19th and 20, or, you know, early 20th century before all their prophecies just completely fell flat on their face. Um, so that being said, we'll, we'll dig into this because I just, just want to make sure we have the right spirit. We want to be able to instruct people and have the information to just be able to show them, hey, do you even, do you even know how your um, you know, denomination f started? Do you even know the history? Do you even know why you're a Seventh-day Adventist? And that word Adventist is referring to the coming of Christ. It's the, they, they, weren't, they weren't always called Seventh-day Adventists. They were just Adventists or Second Adventists talking about the second coming of Christ, meaning that it was just at hand. And what they were teaching is that it was going to happen, you know, right away. And in this case, and there's so many similarities too between the Seventh-day Adventist cult and the Jehovah's Witness cult. And I mentioned that I think briefly last week, when, if it was last week when I went over the, the Jehovah's Witness stuff, but Charles Taze Russell, who was the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, he actually followed uh, an Adventist preacher. He got a lot of it, you know, he was the one that, um, Charles says Russell didn't like the idea of hell, didn't like the idea of, of an of a eternal 
torturous, tormenting hell. He didn't like that. He didn't believe that. Even though that's what he was brought up with, he rejected that. And he found an Adventist preacher, I think his name was Barber, that, uh, that influenced him. And he said, oh, wow, this guy's preaching, you know, that hell's just annihilation or whatever. I like that. And coincidentally, not coincidentally, but um, similarly, the Seventh-day Adventists also have that view of hell, that it's just simply annihilation. And we'll get into some of the other doctrines that they have in a little bit. But um, So the Seventh-day Adventists started off as just Adventists, and they really started off without a name. As the Jehovah's Witnesses, they were, you know, Russellites because they followed Charles Taze Russell. I mean, they just really just had one leader that they were following. They didn't really have an organization name. Similarly, the Seventh-day Adventists, they were following a man named William Miller. So they were called Millerites. They followed this man Miller. And Miller was actually, a, from what I understand, a Baptist preacher. And he made a name for himself because he put a date on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And if you want to know a false prophet, it's really easy when they say, Jesus Christ is coming back on March 22nd, 2018, or whatever date you want to pull out of your hat. If you want to know when Jesus isn't coming back for sure, it's whenever these people have claimed that Jesus for sure is coming. <laughs> I mean, the Bible says that no man knoweth the day or the hour. I mean, it, God, there's no way that God, there's no way that God would put that in scripture of saying no man knows the day or the hour. He says, not even the son, but the father. Jesus himself, when he was on his earth, he didn't even know as he was, as he was preaching, uh, you know, the Olivet Discord, as he was preaching these words, he's, he didn't even know. He didn't know when he was coming back. And you think you know? But people get all into this numerology and other things, you know, oh, we're going to figure out the Bible and I'm going to break the code and, and see it's all here and I, and I figured it out. And the reason why we started in Daniel chapter 8 is because this is the passage that this William Miller used to predict the date of October 22nd, 1844. Now, it's been a little while since October 22nd, 1844. Obviously, Jesus Christ did not come back. But that's what he, uh, that's what he predicted. And the, what he used here was in, if you look at verse 14 of Daniel 8, it says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Yeah. The sanctuary, well, we read verse 13, it says, Then I heard one saint speaking, another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, I don't know what he understood the sanctuary to be, if it was just this whole earth, or, you know, because at this time in 1844, it's not like they had the temple rebuilt and offering daily sacrifices because that is what's being referred to in, in Daniel chapter 8. And when you compare Daniel chapter 8 with the book of Revelation and the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation and, to, and even within Daniel too, you, you, you know, it's, it's not that hard, at least for those of us that are saved, to kind of put the pieces together. Even if you don't have a full grasp on everything, right? You kind of see what this is talking about. But he came up with this date because he used 2,300 days and he said, well, I know it says 2,300 days, but that's really 2,300 years. So he started that from 2,300 years prior to 1844, which I don't know. I mean, it must have been the destruction of the temple or something. I mean, I don't even, that does, I don't even know what would make sense with that date. But I didn't, I didn't care to dig into his, his false prophecy. It doesn't matter that much to me. It doesn't matter to anyone, really, why he came up with this, because he was wrong. So I don't care to, to understand all the reasons why he was wrong. But I know that he used this passage. I know that he said it was years. And that's how he came up with October 22nd, 1844. And he got a lot of people, you know, worked up about this. As other false prophets have in the past. I mean, the most recent one to my memory that's actually gotten people worked up is Harold Camping. I know there's been other people recently that are making these other dates. But I don't think those ones have really had much of a following. I know Harold Camping kind of had a... a, a significant following. He's been doing his, his radio Bible teachings and stuff. You can still hear him on, on the radio at night on, on the, the random, you know, low band 
FM stations or whatever on some of the Christian radio stations, you could still hear his teaching. It was kind of funny. Um, but he's the most recent one. Obviously, he was wrong too. And this was known when, when October 22nd, 1844 came and passed and Jesus Christ didn't come back. This is known as the Great Disappointment. This, is, this was a great disappointment. And actually, William Miller himself admitted that he was wrong, which is kind of rare with a lot of these cults. Like with Charles Taze Russell and, and these other guys, what they did was just kind of kick the can down the road. Oh, oh, I didn't quite understand this a little bit. It's actually this. It's actually, and, and they try to, to, to string people along for a long time. William Miller didn't do that. But by this point, he already had a whole bunch of followers. So his followers had to decide, well, what's the deal here? Which is kind of funny, which is, it, it's also interesting that these groups even survived after that, after Miller himself, the one who came up with this, kind of disavowed and said, yeah, I was, I was wrong about this. Other people still wanted to cling to, no, he's right, you know, but it's actually something else, you know, and, and they, they changed it to be something else. And what they did is they split into three groups. One group is just saying he was just plain wrong and people just abandoned it and left and just said whatever, right? Another group said that that began this closed door policy. So, and what they're referring to is if you remember the parable that Jesus gave of the 10 virgins, five had their, their, their lamps all ready to go and five didn't. And, you know, the, the husband called and then they came and the ones who were ready went and then the other ones, you know, they weren't ready. Then they came and the door was already shut. So what, and, and this, I mean, this is bizarre, but this is what they believe is that no one else was getting saved. That after October 22nd, 1844, the door was shut. That's what that date represented. And that Jesus Christ was still coming back soon, but that was just the door slamming. So too late, everybody, everybody else. No one else is getting saved. And of course, they had to modify that. And then the other group said it was the correct date, but a different event, that, that something else happened. And, and we're going to get into what the Seventh-day Adventists actually believe was this other event. And if I understand correctly, Ellen White, which is uh, considered a prophetess for the Seventh-day Adventist movement, actually believed in that closed door thing as well as what they, what they call um, here the doctrine of the heavenly sanctuary and the investigative judgment. Now, I'm going to read for you. And now, as I try to do with all of these things, I get my information. I, go, I try to go straight to the source because it's easy for some, because for, if the point is to reach people that are caught up in this, because I've heard a lot of testimonies from people who used to be pastors in the church. They were brought up in the church. And, and you know, as I was studying for these things and you know, trying to do some extra research, I would listen to these testimonies, but I'm not going to go off of just a testimony of one person just to present as fact because I don't know of that to be true. But I listen to these things and I try to find, oh, okay, that's pretty interesting. I wanna you know, expose that or show that. I go straight to their source then. Adventist.org is the official website for the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And you can go there and you could verify the information that I'm giving you. I've got one or two other sources that you could also check for yourself, but the majority of what I'm gonna be reading to you is, is, is literally from them. Okay, now, this, uh, this explanation is on the heavenly sanctuary and the investigative judgment, and this has to do with, it's tied in with that date of October 22nd, 1844, and what they believe about that and what they believe is still going on today. They say there is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle which the Lord set up and not man. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. He was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry at the time of his ascension. I'm talking about his resurrection. Okay, you're saying that he, he became our great high priest and he began interceding for us, his intercessory ministry is what it, they call it at the time of his resurrection. So they're saying, as soon as he rose again from the dead, which isn't that far-fetched, right? I'm not saying I agree with what they're saying here, but it's like, okay, he became our intercessor when he rose again from the dead. Fine, right? 
But then it says, in 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2,300 days, which the, the prophetic period of 2,300 days, which is really years, but they, don't, they don't say that, but they say of 2,300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry. Now, where does the Bible say anything about two phases of Jesus' atoning ministry? Because I haven't read that anywhere. And then you go on. It says, it is a work of investigative judgment, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. Now, they are purposely using words that are not clear. This is not a clear statement, so don't feel bad if you're like, what? <laughs> what, what, what? You throw out words like, oh, the ancient Hebrew and the Day of Atonement and all this. You know, they're not really saying anything because what, what they're saying is nonsense. And, and they use these words. It, it really is um, clever you know, and tricky. And, and they, they, they play, and all these cults will play on people's ignorance. That is what they do and that's why we promote, you know, up and down, you need to know the Bible for yourself because you don't want to be deceived by anybody. There are wolves and sheep's clothing all over the place and you need to know the scripture for yourself and not be ignorant. When you're ignorant, you are going to be deceived. And that's how they get people is just through ignorance. They play on your ignorance. And they use words like this, oh, well, they must know what they're talking about and just suck you along because they sound real smart. They sound real educated. They sound like they really know the Bible. And they're really not saying anything or they're saying a bunch of garbage. So I'm going to keep reading here. It says, in that typical service, the sanctuary was cleansed with the blood of animal sacrifices. So this is referring to in the ancient Hebrew sanctuary, right, in the tabernacle, that they would do these sacrifices and um, in that service, the sanctuary was cleansed with the blood of animal sacrifices, that that was the cleansing, the atoning blood that was being shed was these animal sacrifices. But the heavenly things are purified with the perfect sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. Okay, yeah. And notice that they'll, they'll mix in, you know, things that are right and then twist their, their, their version of it. So, that, you know, that's how they also string people along. I mean, the best, li the best lies are full of a lot of half-truths or a lot, you know, like they, they, they make it as close as possible um, to, to string you along. So it says, uh, the investigative judgment reveals to heavenly intelligences who among the dead are asleep in Christ and therefore in him are deemed worthy to have part in the first resurrection. Now, what this is saying, in case you didn't get that, the purpose of an investigative judgment is that there's an investigation going on on all the people. And this started in 1844, that Jesus started an investigation into everybody's life who was in Christ. Mind you, these are people who are in Christ is what they're saying. There's this investigative judgment revealing to the heavenly intelligences, which I could only assume to be God. I don't know what they mean by heavenly intelligences. Who among the dead are asleep in Christ and therefore in him are deemed worthy to have part in the first resurrection. So what it means is they're like, it's like he's, he's investigating their lives. Say, are you really worthy of that first resurrection? Are you worthy of that first resurrection? And this is where they tie in the works. And this is, this is huge false doctrine because basically what they're saying is, Faith alone, being in Christ, is not enough to partake of the first resurrection. That's not enough. You need to have the works, and that's where this investigative uh, judgment is coming into play here. So uh, they continue on, says, It also makes manifest who among the living are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and in him, therefore are ready for translation into his everlasting kingdom. So not only is the investigative judgment, judgment is for the people who have already passed on, but the people who are living right now. And it explicitly is saying, like, you're in the commandments, you're in the word, you're living right, you're doing good, you've got the works to be worthy to be translated at that first resurrection. Which is not what the Bible teaches at all, anywhere. Um... It says, this judgment vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus. What? 
How does this vindicate the justice of God? They just throw out these statements. They just said he's looking at all of your works and then they say, well, see, this vindicates God in, in uh, saving those who believe. But their definition of believe is similar to the Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, they have a very similar background in formation. Is that faith, it, you have to have works in order to even have believe or, or faith. You know, I mean, that, that's the way they understand these words. Which is also something to understand when you're talking to them. When they say it's just faith, it's just believe, their definition of those very words can be different than what you're referring to. Because they're automatically incorporating works into that. Well, if you're not doing the works, then you don't, you don't really believe. You see how that works? Instead of it actually being a belief, like the word itself literally would mean in English. When you look up the definition of a word believe or faith, it's not going to give you a definition of works at all because that's not what the word means. But they have used and abused these words and just redefined them to fit their doctrines, to fit their beliefs. Um, and then it says, the completion of this ministry of Christ will mark the close of human probation before the second advent. That's their, this is what they say happened on that, on that date. Is that, well, Jesus didn't return, but it's, he's entered the second phase. So for the first phase, he's just been up in heaven, you know, being the mediator, the intercessor, until this time of the investigative judgment. Now he's investigating. It's been since 1844. I don't know why they think it takes Jesus so long to investigate. I mean, people are continuing to be born. Is he getting behind? Like, oh man, these people stop having babies because now I got to keep investigating people because it's a time of investigative judgment. I don't know how long they think it takes to investigate people. I mean, I guess maybe he wasn't keeping notes while they were alive. I mean, this is almost 2,000 years now. It was 1,800 years at this time since the time that he rose again from the dead until, until he had to begin this investigative judgment, he must have been slacking off. I don't know. I don't know why people don't think about these things. I mean, it really doesn't make any sense. But this is, this is their doctrine. This is what they claim. And I believe that this is still their doctrine of investigative judgment to this day. I believe that. Now, you may not be running into a lot of people that will claim this or, or understand this or know this or be able to tell you about it that are Seventh-day Adventists. I'm not claiming that, but I still think this is part of their church doctrine. Ellen White, and we're going to get into her in just a little bit, wrote a lot of books, a lot of publications, a lot of materials. Well, <laughs> she plagiarized a lot of materials, but she, she's responsible for a lot of material coming out. And she wrote this book called The Great Controversy. And in The Great Controversy, on page 425, and you could actually find this, you know, this uh, the facsimile on, online, you can look it up for yourself. Page 425, she wrote, Those who are living upon the earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. She's saying you have to have the good works because there's a time that you are going to stand before a holy God without a mediator. And she's talking about people who are in Christ not having Christ as a mediator and standing before God of, yeah, you need the Christ you know, to, to save you, but after you get saved, you have to live the good life and keep the works and do the commandments in order to stand without spot before God. That's what she taught. That's what she's saying here is that you are going to stand without a mediator. Hey, I thought Jesus Christ was the mediator. I thought that, that Jesus Christ was the, was the um, there is you know, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. 
that he is the mediator and that we're not going to be standing before God without a mediator because the moment you put your faith in him, he's become your mediator and he is your mediator and he isn't going to leave your side. He's not going to leave you or forsake you. And this, I mean, this is one of the main reasons why I'm bringing all this up because it's damnable heresies and a lot of people have been deceived by this and it's sending people to hell because of works-based salvation. Now they have a, and, and oh, and just to clarify this also, I don't know if I had, if I've got to have this a little bit later in my notes. So their investigative judgment, what they say happened in, in October of 1844, when this investigative judgment started, what they say is that, you know how the, the old um, tabernacle, as well as the temple, they had like the outer tabernacle where a lot of sacrifice was done. And then they had the holiest of holies, right? Where the Ark of the Covenant was, they had the holiest of holies. So what they say is that, well, from up until 1844, Jesus was kind of doing his intercessory work in, that, in the tabernacle. But then in 1844, he went to the holiest of holies. Like now he's in that, in the, you know, that's the second phase completing the, the atonement for our sins. Which, is, again, zero scriptural evidence for that at all. And, and 1844 and everything else. It makes no sense. Um, other strange teachings that are very similar to the JWs, Seventh-day Adventists believe in annihilation, right? That, that hell is not eternal torment, torture is just people are destroyed. They also believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Remember that when I was preaching on Jehovah's Witnesses? They believe the same thing. Again, they come from like the same roots. So it, it's not that surprising. Now this is from Adventist.org. And this is like newer articles. I went to their website because... With, with place it with like Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists and with the internet, it's a lot easier to show people factual, you know, inf just information on the, you know, the formation of these cults and, and a lot more details on the lives of these people who founded these religions. So in order to save face, in order to save anything, they have to answer this to, you know, one way or another. They, they have to put out something some form of an answer to the critics and to the people who are going to be bringing up all this information. See, before, before the flow of information was, you know, was readily available, it's a lot easier for the cults to deceive people. It's a lot easier for anyone to deceive people, but when you have the information at your fingertips, you say, oh, no, no, look at this. I mean, you can pull it right up on your phone these days and be like, look at this. Look at what LNG White did. Look at what these guys, look at Charles Taze Russell. You know, look at these prophecies. Look at all this stuff. So in order to continue moving forward in the modern world, they have to, to write some type of articles to whitewash or save face or whatever. And even in those articles, I'm going to read excerpts from you that I pulled literally off of Adventist.org that explain their history, their own history, from their website. So mind you, as I read this, this is out of their own mouths. It says, and, and this, these are just, I'm, I'm kind of pulling some things. I'm not, we're not going to read the whole article. Um, I, just, I just copied and pasted a few things that I thought were interesting. They said, The U.S. Northeast in the early 19th century was a hotbed of revival. Remember, I was talking about we're, we're, we're looking at you know, Joseph Smith, Charles Taze Russell, Ellen White, you know, his Miller. They were all forming these cults in the late 1800s, which is the 19th century. I was the one saying that, like, we, isn't it kind of weird that all of these cults are all popping up like just in this, in this one time frame? Well, they're referring to this time frame as a hotbed of revival. Oh man, what a great revival. All these cults are popping up. Like that's a good thing. And, and they're literally are lumping themselves in with the other cults of the time. They say the so-called second great awakening ignited movements such as the Shakers, early Mormons, the forerunners of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Millerites, and a host of eccentric offshoots. As if those weren't eccentric offshoots. <laughs> There's other eccentric offshoots, right? I mean, it doesn't get much weird. You know, in the Shakers, if you don't know, I mean, these are the weird Pentecostal groups that it's, you know, it's shaking, oh, 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 you know, doing the whole getting possessed by demons and rolling on the floor, the Holy Rollers, stuff like that. And the, the, the Quakers is what they became, you know, the Shakers, the Quakers, all, all of this stuff. Is, is weird, cultic, and just started completely from scratch, basically, in the late 1970s. And, and they're already associating themselves with, like, 
if you don't want to be called a cult, because none of them wants to be called a cult. The Mormons are trying their best to, no, nah, we're not a cult, we're crazy, we're just like you. Right? No, 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 we believe just like you, you don't understand. No, no, you don't, you're a cult. <laughs> Seventh-day Advent, the same thing. If you don't want to be associated with cults, then don't list it in your article of your formation. I mean, at least they're being honest here. But that's coming from their own mouth. And then they said, in this climate, the Millerites weathered the great disappointment when the group expectantly but futilely waited for Christ's return. So they're, I mean, they're admitting at least that there was this great, I mean, you can't deny it. They have to just come out and admit it. Now, they don't go into why that's so important that your religion was founded by a guy that was just a false prophet because he didn't get a word from God, even though he said he got a word from God. And the Bible says not to listen to those people, not to be afraid of them, and that they're not sent by God. That's the whole reason why you even bring this stuff up. He's a false prophet. You stop from that point forward. You don't continue with these religions. Done. But they just kind of brush past that. Oh, yeah, they weathered. They got through that great disappointment when they were totally deceived by a false prophet. But they stuck through and continued with the other teachings because, you know, those all were true, even though the, <laughs> the big one was wrong. Those who remained were split over the significance of October 22nd. Some claimed the date was altogether bogus. Others maintained Christ had returned, but only in a spiritual, illusory sense. A final group, the future leaders of the early Seventh-day Adventists, were convinced the date was right, but the event was wrong. What they concluded is that instead of returning to earth on October 22nd, Jesus had begun the last phase of his atoning ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. I already went over that from a previous quote. Um, at this point, you know, Miller got out of the movement and this is when there were, there were multiple leaders early on, but I'm not going to get into all of them because Ellen G. White and her husband James White were kind of the two that really were the impetus and um, the, the source of the formation of many of their doctrines. Of the vast majority of their doctrines are coming from her because they considered her prophetic visions to be from God. So they incorporated that into their belief system. Um, so again, continuing from this article, it says, early on pioneers such as James White were fervent in their call to come out of Babylon. At first, this was a message to leave organized religion and return to gospel simplicity. So when their group was real small, after the great disappointment, James White's teaching that you need to come out of Babylon. And you know, we've got uh, internet preachers now saying the same thing. Oh, you go to those Babel buildings and... and and whatever, you know, that organized religion, you just need to go back to, you know, this is exactly what James White did. Come out of Babylon and, and, you know, leave organized religion, return to gospel simplicity. That was his message. But what this article says, but what is striking, Trim says, is the reversal White pulls as the movement expanded. So now as they're gaining members and gaining steam, they're becoming an organized religion. Right? He was just saying, come out of Babylon, get out of those organized religions. Well, now they're becoming an organized religion. So here's what he does. This is by 1859, James had come to believe that the call to come out of Babylon actually meant to leave this organization and accept church structure. It's the exact opposite of what he originally said. I mean, he's completely changed it to be 180 degrees, the exact opposite of what he originally taught. But that's what false prophets do. They keep on selling you the new snake oil and changing everything in the past and just hope that you're going to forget about it. And many people, oh, yeah, okay, oh, this is the new thing. Oh, you know, they're, they're like the, the people by, you know, by Mars Hill, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just interested and, and want to know some new thing. What's the newest thing? Oh, what are we teaching now? Oh, yeah, that was wrong. Yeah, wasn't that funny? Well, let's, just, let's hear the new thing. Yeah, we were duped by that, but let's just keep going forward anyways. This, of course, plays very nicely on the fact that Babylon ultimately comes from Babel. The, so his new definition or understanding of coming out of Babylon or confusion. So he's saying, come out of this organization and come to a structured you know, place. And he's saying, see, come out of Babylon. Babel means confused. So come out of that confusion and come to a good structure. And White says the call to come out of Babylon is actually to leave all this chaos, chaotic and extre uh, incredibly exciting and fervent religious current and come into something a little more organized. So what it means to come out of Babylon completely gets turned on its head and subverted. This is from their own website. <laughs> I'm not reading from someone who is making fun of Seventh-day Adventists. 
You can go to Adventist.org and read this article for yourself. These are the founders of their religion. And they're like, they're, they're posting these, these articles mocking themselves, literally. Continuing on, he says, it's an equilibrium. The Adventist church still maintains today, Trim says, and it finds its roots in the long-standing tension between spirit and order, dating back to the early medieval church. You have to have the spirit because order becomes staid and ossified and hierarchical. They're basically, what he's saying is that you have to have spirit and order. Catch this. Because if you just have order, right, it becomes just too rigid and kind of becomes, they didn't say this, but basically pharisaical, right? Like you just get this real rigid uh, religion. So you need the spirit to kind of spruce things up and keep it going and keep it on track. He says, but you have to have the order because the spirit becomes chaotic and self-destructive, he says. Well, obviously, they're not operating under the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen in Scripture the Holy Spirit being chaotic and self-destructive. Right. But the Spirit that they're operating under, of course it is. The demonic spirit in possession, yeah, that is chaotic. Yeah, that is destructive. Yeah, they need to try to get some kind of order to that or else they're going to implode and self-destruct because they are under a different spirit. Continuing on here, despite disagreement, Adventists ultimately rallied behind biblical truth achieved through prayer and Bible study or revealed through, or revealed through prophecy. And this is a big part of, of their cult. Uh, these men are wholly persuaded that Ellen White is God's messenger. If she says, I have been shown this, they accept it even if they don't initially like it Trim says. This is the article on their Adventist website explaining about how Ellen White in those times and among their, her peers and among other people that were in that group that if she said, they were so persuaded that she was a messenger of God that if she said, I've been shown this, they just accepted it because they were convinced that she was a messenger of God. And this is their problem to this day. They said even if they didn't like it at, at first, you know, they didn't initially like it, well, well, she said it. I mean, she saw it. It must be coming from God because she's God's messenger. Instead of searching the scriptures daily that these things might be so, no, just, well, she's God's messenger. This is one of the main reasons why they're a cult, by the way. We went through definitions of a cult. When you have someone and they're just saying, well, whatever she says or he says or whatever they say, God's just speaking to them and that's just the way it is. And it doesn't matter if it contradicts scripture. It doesn't matter what she say. It doesn't matter if I don't like it because it just has to be God's word because she's a prophet of God. That's their history. And Ellen White, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I mean, we could, I could literally go on for hours. And I spent a lot of time researching this stuff and trying to decide what I wanted to include and what I didn't want to include. You look at the life of Ellen White, that lady, <laughs> and I don't even have it in. She, she plagiarized. She, she claimed to be this prophet of God, but she also had very minimal education. I don't remember, recall exactly what level of education she had, but it was grade school, right? Just grade school uh, education, yet her writings had a great vocabulary. So they would say, oh, well, I mean, obviously God's, you know, working through her because she's able to write this stuff that she doesn't even have the education for. Well, no, no, actually, she was a ripoff artist and this is well documented, and, and I, I saw for myself, I don't just want to come up and make accusations. I don't have the source. Of, oh, um, you can look up the, I think it's called The Great White Lie. I believe that's the name of, of the book, so, The Something White Lie. And the guy's last name, I think, was Ray. And he, uh, he does comparisons of the actual works that she plagiarized with her books side by side and just shows... I mean, in one instance, she literally copied like the table of contents and like all the chapters of her book were exactly the same as another book with like a tweak here or there. I mean, imagine yourself if you had a paper in high school that you had to do a research paper and you didn't want to do it and you wanted to plagiarize, but you, you knew you had to like change some words to, to, to not, 
to try to not make it as obvious or, you know, whatever. That's what she did. But it's obvious, right? So for the, for the teacher grading the paper, it's obvious, right? It does, your, your few words that you, you switched the order on or changed up a little bit doesn't fly. And, and that book documents the, all the time. And she, she even stole images, like literal images that they had in a book. She copied that and put that in her book. No credit, no sourcing, nothing. I mean, she, she took the images, she took sources. So all this stuff she's producing, so, oh yeah, God's using me. She was just compiled from all these different theologians. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy to me. Now, I'm going to get into, and, and now look, there are people even today that they reject Ellen White. I'd actually talked to one out soul winning. That was a Seventh-day Adventist. He's, oh yeah, I don't, but I, I don't, I don't, you know, subscribe to Ellen White and her teaching and stuff like that. Why are you Seventh-day Adventist? I mean, she, she was foundational in the movement, even being a movement, even being an organization and, and all the things that they, they believe and have espoused have come like from her. She's a source. But here is, again, from their Adventist.org website, part of, they, they have their fundamental beliefs. I think it's like the 28 fundamental beliefs. Okay? This is there to this day. This is their current fundamental beliefs. Number 10 is their exper the experience of salvation is a title. Here's what they say. In infinite love and mercy, God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. Now notice as we read through this, you'll read a lot, there's a lot of statements like this. Like, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's right. And this is why it's so subtle and this is why it could be so dangerous for people caught up in these cults because there are so many things that they could have right. But where they're wrong, they're extremely wrong. It's really bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's damnable heresy. So um, continuing on, it says, led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need. Acknowledge our sinfulness, which I agree with that. We have to acknowledge our sinfulness. We have to acknowledge that we're sinners and we deserve a punishment. But then, of course, they say, repent of our transgressions, which lumps them in with every other false Christian religion that's out there. And exercise faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, substitute and example. And this is similar to what the Jehovah's Witnesses, their New World Translation even says, you know, active faith, exercise your faith, exercise your faith, which, which, which is involved works, right? Not just faith, but exercising your faith, which means doing something with your faith which is not what the Bible teaches. I mean, it does in, in certain areas, right? I mean, doing good works and things, but not for your salvation. This is in, in completely in context of the experience of salvation. Exercise your faith. And then it says, this saving faith comes through the divine power of the word and is the gift of God's grace, which I didn't even realize they had any hints of Calvinism in, in, in them. But what they're saying is that this saving faith is the gift of God's grace, that your faith is God's gift, right? So, so that's what the Calvinists would say, is that God's gift to you is that he's given you the faith in order to believe on him. And that's where the Calvinist comes up with the, you didn't do anything. You didn't even put your faith on Christ because God gave you that gift to be able to believe on him. Therefore, God chose you and you're, you're you know, one, one of his chosen, one of his elect because he gave you that gift to believe on him. Now, I don't know. I mean, I, honestly, honestly, I don't know if they even mean this, the way it's worded. I could only assume that they do, but the way that the, the sentence is structured is saying that this faith is the gift of God's grace. Or some idiot wrote it that doesn't understand English and, and didn't know what they were doing. Um, number 18 in their fundamental beliefs is the gift of prophecy. Here's what they say. And again, this is today. This is current. This is their beliefs. The scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church. And we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. So they still subscribe to Ellen White as, a, as an organization, as Adventist church. They subscribe to, to the ministry of Ellen G. White. She said that she had the gift of, the Holy, of, the, of prophecy. And then it says, her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. 
They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested, which again doesn't make any sense. It's contradictory. This makes, well, how does her work make clear that the Bible is the standard? Because she contradicts the Bible. But again, I mean, they need to throw that in there to say, oh, no, no, but we really believe the Bible is what they're doing with that last statement. Even though they just got done saying her writings speak with prophetic authority. They're putting her writings on par with the Bible. Why? Because she was a prophetess, right? She had the words of God. And look, and, and you would have to do that. If someone's claiming to be a prophet of the Lord and saying, thus saith the Lord, then it needs to be on par with Scripture because it would be God's word. That's what she claimed, and you can't get around that. The way they try to wiggle out of these things, they say, oh, well, I just saw the vision. Maybe I misinterpreted it. That's how they try to, to wiggle out of when they, when they make these false prophecies. And here's also from their website in a different portion uh, where they say how to study the Bible. Because I looked at that too. Like, well, how should I study the Bible? And they give all kinds of points prior to this one on um, relying on the authority of Scripture and things like that. You know, and they give some, some normal, decent points when you study the Bible. But then they say this, Seventh-day Adventists believe that God inspired Ellen G. White. Therefore, her expositions on any given Bible passage offer an inspired guide to the meaning of texts without exhausting their meaning or preempting the tax of exegesis. So they are, they are today stating that Ellen White, her words, her expositions, they offer inspired meaning. They, can get, they are going to give you the truth on what the Bible means. If you run into anybody that's a, that's a Seventh-day Adventist, and they say, because I didn't even know, when I talked to that guy, I didn't know these things still. Like, I knew a little bit about Ellen White. I knew some, you know, some basic information on Seventh-day Adventism. But if you run into someone that, that's going to say, well, I don't really subscribe to Ellen White, then why are you an Adventist? Because your own organization is still citing Ellen White as being an authority within your religion. Say, you know, if you want to keep the Sabbath or whatever, I, you know, that's up to you, but I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't call myself a Seventh-day Adventist. If, that's, if that is one of your fundamental beliefs as a church, I mean, it's not even, you know, a, a secondary belief. This is, this is their fundamental beliefs. And then, of course, they have a, a section on death and resurrection, which is point number 26. They're one of the fundamental beliefs, number 26, where they say the wages of sin is death, but God, who alone is immortal, will grant eternal life to his redeemed. Until that day, so until the day that we're redeemed, meaning the rapture, death is an unconscious state for all people. When Christ, who is our life, appears, the resurrected righteous and the living righteous will be glorified and caught up to meet their Lord. That's what's commonly known as soul sleep. So what they believe is that when you die, we're all going to die, that everybody, whether you're saved or unsaved, you die and you just go unconscious. And you just kind of, you just, you're asleep until the rapture. And then that's when you're going to be judged. You're either saved or you're not saved. And if you're not saved, you just get annihilated. There's no torture or torment. It's just, again, similar to Job. You know, God wakes you up. Okay, time to wake up. Okay, now you're destroyed again. Right? I mean, you were just unconscious. You had no idea what was going on. You might as well have been annihilated. But he wakes you up to annihilate you to just go back to basically the same state you were in before. But you just don't exist now. Because that's justice according to them. Doesn't line up with the God of the Bible. But anyways, that's another one of their weird teachings. And you could go to Luke chapter 16 is a great place to prove that wrong. When you got the rich man and Lazarus showing that they both died and it wasn't the rapture yet and the rich man was in hell and was in torments and the beggar was in Abraham's bosom. He was in paradise. He was in heaven. Yes, up, not in the center of the earth. He was in heaven and, and was comforted. And everything was going well with him because he was saved. And that's what happens when you die. You go to one of two places. You don't, you're not asleep in the earth. Here's part of their rules on observing the Sabbath. I went over the Sabbath this morning, but um, I'm just going to read this real quickly. 
We're, well, I'm almost done. Um, they say any attempt to regulate, and I just thought this was kind of interesting. If you remember this morning when I was teaching on the Sabbath, how, God, how, how big of a deal it is to God, he put the death penalty on it, and, and how strict it is in, in regards to working. You know, you can't even go and gather sticks and things, you know, it's it really strict. And the exception was basically, well, if you're doing good, if you're, if you're working for God, that type of a thing, that's, that's acceptable. That wasn't what the Sabbath was about to, to eliminate doing good for people, right? It was just to eliminate work and, so, you know, things like that. So, um, and, and there's more reasons to that as well. But regardless, um, here's what they say, though, because they're supposedly real big at observing the Sabbath, right? But here's what they say. Any attempt to regulate Sabbath observance beyond biblical principles by developing lists of Sabbath prohibitions will be counterproductive to a sound spiritual experience. So what they're saying is, don't go making yourself lists of things you can't do on the Sabbath. Because that's just not productive. <laughs> the Christian will test his Sabbath experience by principle. He knows that it is the main purpose of the Sabbath to strengthen the bond of union between himself and God. Thus, one's activities, guided by biblical principles and con contributing towards such a strengthening, are acceptable. And look at what they, they say this then. Inasmuch as no one can evaluate rightly the personal motives of others, a Christian must be very careful not to criticize his brethren living in cultural contexts other than his own who engage in Sabbath recreational activities of which they approve. So what they're saying there basically is they're saying don't judge other Adventists in the way that they keep the Sabbath. Now the reason why I think they're saying that is because they know that they're all hypocritical when it comes to the Sabbath. So if you've got someone who's actually want, is sincere and wants to, to observe the Sabbath and knows their Bible a little bit and sees, you know, we can't be doing anything. As I was saying this morning, they're saying, no, no, you can't make those lists for people because you don't know their heart. You don't know what, what their motive is. Really? Because do you think that matters to God? Like when, with Cain and Abel, wasn't Cain's motive good? When he brought a sacrifice, when he, when he brought the best of his works to God? It was a good motive. I mean, but God knew his heart, right? Was it acceptable to God? No, of course not, because that's not what God told him to do. And it's the same thing with the Sabbath. You know, I mean, the guy collecting sticks that they caught out collecting sticks. What should we do with this guy? God said, put him to death. But you don't know his motive. I mean, maybe he was going to, to make a big greeting card out of those sticks or something and, and give it to someone and say, I love you. I don't know. You know, we don't know his motive, so we can't judge him. No, you can. I mean, we, we, you gotta, you know, God gave this and made the Sabbath a, a civil government law to be able to put people to death. If he did that, then he was giving the ability to judge the Sabbath unto people. It is something that is capable of being judged, of whether or not you're keeping the Sabbath. It's not something that, that you could just say, oh, you just can't judge anything on the Sabbath because you just don't know, you know, you don't know their culture or whatever. God, no, God says, I mean, it is clear in his commandment what it was. Now, like I said, just because people misinterpreted that doesn't change God's view of the Sabbath and the reason why he instituted it and, and everything else and, and the fact that it was a death penalty crime that if you broke the Sabbath needed, you know, needed to be executed and someone needed to make that judgment and it was people on this earth. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now, they also believe in you know, these dietary laws of the Bible of you know, not eat, you know, all the dietary restrictions in the Mosaic law and they teach and promote vegetarianism they have a, a big, sec, you know, kind of a, a big portion of their, uh, their belief system has to do with healthy living. And I, I decided not to really get into that, even though it is kind of significant as far as their religion's concerned. But um, I'll just read for you. I reread a little bit of this this morning, Romans 14, you know, talking about the things that have changed between the Old Testament and the New Testament, how the dietary restrictions have been lifted. Romans 14, verses 1, 2, and 3 say, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. I mean, that alone right there tells you that, you know, there's one person that thinks they could eat all things, which is true. 
And there's another person who thinks that they should only be eating herbs, which is your vegetarian. And the Bible's clear that the person who thinks that you could only be eating herbs is weak. They don't have full understanding because that's not true. But it's not a big deal. So if someone thinks, no, no, you got to be a vegetarian, okay, be a vegetarian. I'm not going to judge you for that. I don't care, right? Go ahead and be a vegetarian. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's not, it's, it's not a problem. But don't come judging me when I'm eating meat and tell me I can't do that or I'm eating pork or shellfish because I can eat all things because you know, don't call that common or unclean which God has cleansed and, and, and God has, had lifted the dietary restriction. And again, I could preach a whole sermon on that, but I just wanted to bring up a few verses on that. Now, Here's what one of their, their articles said about modern Seventh-day Adventists. When they were given a whole article about the history and I read a lot of excerpts from. So here's what they say about modern Seventh-day Adventists. They say, modern Seventh-day Adventists might find early Adventist pioneers peculiar. So you might find them peculiar. They're, they're really weird. They're different. Meaning that, I mean, the religion has changed that much from the pioneers days. Some didn't believe in the Trinity or the personhood of the Holy Spirit and thought Christ was a created being. Why are you in this religion then? That's what your pioneers believed. Many observed Sabbath from 6 p.m. Friday to 6 p.m. Saturday, regardless of actual sunset times. Like they throw, they throw that in there with the Trinity. <laughs> As if that's really that big of a deal. They're like, oh, some of them didn't even actually use the real sunset. They used 6 p.m. <laughs> Who cares about that? It, 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 it compared with the Trinity and the deity of Jesus Christ, like, like that's on par with those, with those subjects. They also had no qualms over eating unclean meats. Hey, they had, they, your pioneers had something right. <laughs> Why did you reject that one? All this, however, would change in the coming decades. Out of their own mouths, all, all of this would change. I thought they were prophets. I thought they had the word of God. They are the founders of your religion. Why did you stay in that religion? Why? Why stay in that religion? Their cult had to change a lot because the beliefs were so weird and they're so easily disproved from Scripture. They had nothing to stand on. They had one person who was a charlatan who plagiarized and claimed to have these visions and prophecies that they were going off of. And it's weak. It's not a foundation. It's just shifting sands because they weren't founded on the rock. They're founded on, on the sand. They're founded on, on, on devils. Turn if you go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew, I know we didn't get into a lot of Bible tonight, but I do think it's important to every once in a while cover this type of thing. And the, the main purpose, again, is to understand a little bit about where they're coming from to, just to, to help try to reach them. We're not replacing the way we give the gospel to any of these people. We're giving the gospel the same way, but if, if you still have an opportunity with someone to reach him, you know, anyone, anyone who is of a sincere heart can receive the gospel and get saved. Anyone who really cares about seeking God and knowing who God is, they will get saved. They can get saved. You know, I mean, they, they, you know, and we want to do the best job that we possibly can to reach them. And when we can expose some of the lies and expose some of the, the, the things... That, um, that most of them aren't even aware of, you know, maybe something will stick with them and be like, oh, wow, maybe I should look into this a little bit more. Maybe I should reconsider. Because their current beliefs, and that's why I brought up all the, you know, many of their current beliefs, are still way wrong and way false. Even though they maybe have changed a lot of the things that their founders had, their current beliefs are still wrong. Drastically wrong. Immensely wrong. Damnably wrong. Matthew 7, very famous passage, you know, and, and, and this is ultimately, you know, these people who want to remain Adventist, their root, their source was evil, corrupt, and wicked. 
You don't want to stay within that. You need to repent. You need to get out of that. You need to change from that belief system and not try to keep it around and, and clean it up a little bit and dust it off a little bit. I mean, even like, like Martin Luther just wanted to change the Catholic Church. No, I mean, it's completely false. You know, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't fix it. You just need to get saved and get in the right church. You know, get in a right church and get out of that, that false denomination. Matthew 7, 15, the Bible said, Jesus was given warning. He said, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. And again, this is in context. He's telling you how to beware of a false prophet, not how to understand if someone's saved or not. False prophets are known by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth, uh, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. The tree is the prophet. Not your average believer or unbeliever. It's the prophet. The prophet brings forth fruit. The prophet brings forth proselytes or disciples. They're reproducing themselves. If they're a good tree, they can't bring forth evil fruit. What they will reproduce is other fruit of the same kind as they are. If, it, if they're good, it'll be good. If they're a true prophet, they'll, they'll produce other good you know, uh, believers. If they're a wolf, a false prophet, they cannot bring forth good. They cannot get people saved. They cannot lead people to Christ. They are there to deceive. All they can do is bring forth other false prophets and other people who are damned to hell. That's why Jesus Christ said, you know, you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when you make him, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Because they were false prophets that brought forth evil fruit, and what the fruit that they brought forth was twofold more a child of hell than themselves. That's what this passage is teaching, and that's why anyone who's going to want to reject, you know, Ellen White and the root of the tree of that religion. You need to just get out of it because it's not bringing forth good fruit and it never will bring forth good fruit because it's a corrupt tree. And in order for people to, you know, if you want to get saved, you need to, you need to repent of that belief system, reject it completely and put all of your faith in Jesus Christ. Not that you're going to be standing before God without a mediator and relying on your own works. Not that you need to provide the best that you have. You need the grace of God and your best. No, it's sol, sol, solely through, I want to say solamente, sole, solely through Jesus Christ. That's it. And, and, you know, that's the primary reason why, you know, why this is so important. All of the cults, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, all of a false gospel, a damnable gospel of works-based salvation. And we need to bring them the truth. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words for the truth, the, the, the easy truth, the um, clear scriptures that you give us to know how to be saved, to know, I mean, basic instructions and commandments for our lives, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be wise, help us to um, be stirred up to read the scriptures for ourselves, that we could know what's true, that we wouldn't be ignorant, that we wouldn't just be deceived and caught up by some charismatic preacher or leader that's going to lead us astray, that's a false prophet. But Lord, help us to, to follow those who are, who are doing what's right, who are good trees, who are bringing forth good fruit, Lord, and um, help us to know the difference and, and that we can be in our Bibles regularly to know this. And help us to reach people that are, that are mixed up in these cults and the Seventh-day Adventists, Lord. Help us to reach them and to, to be able to effectively preach the gospel to them Show them the error of their religion that they could repent and get saved by putting their faith completely on Jesus for their salvation. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be better soul winners and have more knowledge and wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.